Hey guys, I just talked with one of my favorite authors, Felicia Morrell. Uh, she's been on the podcast one other time. Um, she has a book coming out in February. It's called And the Restorative Power of Love in an Either-Or World. This book is an invitation to encounter the lived experience and philosophical musings of another as a human, not as a project or agenda to conquer. Without apology, it embraces humanity and all the emotions, backstories, and history that comes along with who we are and who love is inviting us to be. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit more because this is what we talked about, touching on issues of race, which we did dive into, a body, motherhood, church, which we dove into, and wonder, which we dove into. These writings are from the stirrings of the author's own soul, Felicia, extending an invitation to sit with spirit in the process of mindful meditation, to humbly sit with compassion and curiosity in ways that evoke honesty and healing so that one might move beyond either or and discover how the restorative power and uniting thread of love, when we talked about love, might be stitching each of us to the world and to each other. Guys, it was a powerful conversation. Felicia is a deep well. She, um, she writes and she communicates with grace. Her heart is for connection. Her heart is empathetic in all things. Um, and, and love is the foundation, the very foundation. It's the beginning, the end, the before, the after, and everything in between with Felicia. I, I told her I feel like I'm talking to a sister, someone who's navigated um, and come to some of the same discoveries that I'm coming to, um, that all things, that every question that aches in the heart of humanity is answered in a greater revelation of, of our Father's affection, of Holy Spirit's affection, of, 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 of Jesus's friendship. So I think you're going to be blessed by this conversation. I was, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, getting her back on the podcast uh, and hopefully sooner than another year. Guys, grateful to be doing this podcast. Thankful for all of the life around it. Thankful for uh, Derek and uh, the role in the friendship and the way that he's impacted my life and grateful um, for all the guests that we get to have on. I'm just thankful, thankful for those who give. This is a listener supported podcast. Um, you can partner with us at a familystory.org. You can also sign up for our mailing list there. We'll keep you up to date on podcasts. Um, we're about to get some sweaters, some merch. Uh, you can also read articles and connect with folks that we've had on the podcast through the website. Um, like, share, write a review on iTunes and join us on our Facebook page. Lots of amazing community and conversation taking place there. It's under the name Rethinking God with Tacos or follow us on Instagram, same handle. And I guess that's it. <laughs> I'm getting better at, at this thing, but not perfect, which I think is, is, a, is a likable thing about me. So I've been told, I uh, love you guys. Um, this is my conversation with Felicia Morrell. Hey, Felicia. Well, this is, this is, I tell, I can't tell you, I have, uh, just before we got on, I was telling you how much I've been looking forward to this conversation because I really, really love talking to you. There's so much life in it. And, um, and we have so many mutual connections. Um, Randall Worley, I mentioned, I was talking with him this morning and when I mentioned you were coming on, he just lightened right up. It was like, Oh my goodness, pass my love on, but, Hello. uh, Thank it's you. good to have you on the podcast again. You know, it's been a year since, since you were on, this is the That's second time. Crazy. Wow. I know. Well, thank you so much for having me back. It's, it's an honor. I don't always get invited back. So <laughs> it's a joy to, to be a repeat for sure. Um, but no, it's really my honor to be here. So thanks, Jason. We, we jokingly say that um, um, uh, we have a jacket for the third time, you know, the third time you're on, we'll send you a jacket, you know, like they do at SNL. But I love that. Uh, I'm just letting you know there'll be a third. <laughs> but I'll hey, say, when we make when we sure had my you... jacket has tacos on it so we can <laughs> talk We're about working tacos. on some branding. Gotcha. <laughs> but uh, um, when we talked, a year ago, you were telling me about the book you were working on. And I think some of it's, some of it spilled into our conversation, yeah. but, uh, I had, I was salivating about this particular book 
and I, and I, I, I mentioned it to you before we got on, uh, and I'm going to have you share a little bit about who you are, but I, I just got to say it, it's a masterpiece. It's, uh, it's profoundly revelatory. It's full of grace. It's poetic. Uh, there's so much there. Um, it's, there's, uh, there's narrative. Uh, you can't put it down. I was trying to prepare for this. I was trying to, to take pull quotes and I finally had to put the book down. I was like, there's, we're not going to get to all of them. Um, but I am so, so thankful for this book. Can I, I'm going to read this as, cause this is a Jerzak's endorsement and I like reading endorsements cause sometimes they're, people spend time on them. They've read the book. My dear friend and exemplar asks, who are you in the eyes of love? Which of course is what this book's about. This is what it's all about. Oh, and you, God. you carry it. Uh, you, you walk in it. You're a walking revelation of it. Here's, here's what he says. I'm uh, sorry. I just interrupted myself to tell you how thankful I am for you through memories made vivid and her poetic treasury. Uh, Felicia Morrell gently guides me, Jerzak yet again, back into love's embrace uh, there in the both and of my own real life, wounds and wonders, beauty and affliction. I remember again, I am beloved. I often forget. But Felicia's kind voice represents for me what a healed conscience can become in full bloom. I will wear this book out. That's by Brad Jerzak. And I, I, I love uh, how he's forgotten and he remembers again in the reading of this book because that's what was happening. I was remembering my first love uh, I, over and over and over as I was reading this book. And, and you, you go after things in the book, um, but, but always in the confidence of love uh, and the generosity and the humility of love. So uh, I'm excited to dive in. I've hopefully let people know how much I'm excited about this book. But share a little bit just first about who you are, and, and then you can speak to that quote and we can dive in. Yeah, I, I appreciate, Jason, that so much, um, Brad's quote, and even just that impact of um, love thrumming through the pages and the invitation to remember, yeah. re-encounter, re-engage with. Um, and really, I when people ask me all the time, you know, who are you? What do you want people to know? The thing that I most want people to know is that I'm just a woman changed by love. I <laughs> am uh, still very much all of who I who I am. I see the world as it is, and it's easy in the person that I am to hold it with critique and cynicism and all of those things. And then love comes um, to me, and love moves through me, and love reframes and allows me to see fully as love sees and to see clearly with that clear eyed seeing. And when that happens, you know, it brings empathy and compassion first for and to myself and then out from there. Um, you know, I grew up in the South, so I am always, always um, back to my roots. I was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in rural North Carolina and um, have been fortunate to live in a lot of states in the states traveled a lot of different places and had a lot of different ex experiences um primarily within church doug and i have um been church leaders been church yeah. pastors um and now i primarily work in spiritual space as a spiritual director and i work um vocationally as an editor you know that's pretty much my life right now that and and I do a lot of volunteer things so yeah we're both doing that uh I, that's what I'm uh I'm constantly editing a book for someone uh so I know that world well I think we yeah. could connect around our love for putting words on page yeah. Yeah. um I'm going to quote you already because in your preface um, you wrote, I exist to exist. I exist to love. I exist to receive love as a continuous experience in my heart to live in it and give it away to others. And, um, you know, uh, I'm almost 50, but uh, I, the, the journey of my life has been an awakening to the, to the love that never leaves or forsakes me. That's better than the last best thought I had about it. Um, 15 years ago was when I had a, a, a pivotal shifting moment in my life. And, and I've preached this message. In fact, when I 
when, wherever I go, I always start. So this resonated with me, what, what you wrote here. I, I always start with, you know, God is love. He looks like Jesus. He's always good. And then I exist to grow sure in love, more sure today than I was yesterday, or sure, to, more sure tomorrow, or sure tomorrow than I am today. And from that place is the liberty to navigate a whole lot of uh, rethinking, a whole lot of addressing a whole lot of certainties, uh, cultural constructs, religious constructs. And that's what you do in this book. But you do it from this foundation, uh, yeah. uh, from this foundation of love. I, I, I could keep reading because I, I put the whole preface in here and thought, OK, it's all quotable. <laughs> but you, at the end, you say, may the eyes and ears of our hearts hear nothing but the tender whispers of divine love. Um, maybe share a little bit about the the reshifting in your life. And then let's start to, let's start the front end of the book, because you, you hit on some major uh areas within the church that we are rethinking and, yeah. and repenting of. Yeah. And I think that was big for me. You and I share some commonalities in our church background. And, yeah. and so, you know, that um, the prophetic world and purpose and destiny and um, the idea of being a history maker, world changer, yeah. um, the grand, right. And, and my end of that is there's nothing wrong um, with any of that. And yeah. um, for sure, there are people that, that have that calling to be those things. And in some way, we all are called to those things. But I think what happens is a lot of times our imagination um, causes us to envision that on a large power over dominant kind yeah. of I'm going to be in the spotlight. Um, I'm, my name is going to be known. And, and through my name being known, Jesus will be made famous. You right. know, kind of language. And when that doesn't happen or if that doesn't happen, often um, in that space, we can turn inward. And then it's like, oh, something has to be wrong with me or either I've done something wrong or I am wrong, however we take on shame or however we um, judge ourselves harshly in those things, or we get disillusioned and disappointed with God that the prophetic words we've received right. haven't come, come, you know, true come to pass and all these kinds of things. And one of the things that happened, and I honestly, Jason, I never expected in encountering love in the way that I did as big as I did, that it would up in my world in the way that it has huh. and reframe so much. I thought it would just fit neatly into my little Christian box that I, I loved. I loved right. the right. world, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but that invitation from love to hand love everything that I believe to be true and to allow spirit to sift those things. And in that sifting, here I am today, um, in the freedom um, yeah. of just living loved, you know? Yeah. And so what that means is I, I, I'm not just handing you my doctrinal beliefs, my dogma, those institutionalized things. I'm handing you every prophetic word that I've ever had. Uh, yeah. I'm handing yeah. you everything that I've ever thought to be true about ideas around destiny or purpose or whatever. And, and I'm allowing through the eyes of love, to come to a statement that feels true and good and right and beautiful. Yeah. And that is that I exist to exist. And what yeah. what I know to be true from the eyes of loves is that each, each of us are gifts, not just that we have gifts, but we ourselves, our bodies, our beings are gifts. And if I can hold that in, in my heart, that when I am encountering another person, an animal, any part of creation, right. that right. this is a gift. This is a sacred burning bush that I am encounter, encountering. Wow. And I can hold it with that tenderness and that care and that compassion. How I respond and react um, to that individual becomes completely different. Yeah. Because now, you know, I, I'm just, I can't dismiss. I can't dehumanize. I can't because I see that is the glory, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I come to that differently. And so for me, that first piece is almost like, it feels like my credo, you know, 
Um, and it doesn't matter. I'm not chasing roles and titles and functions anymore. Mm. Um, however, I get to participate in the flow of love. Yeah. I can say yes to that. And yeah. for me, it's yes until it's no. And so then if that role or title <laughs> or function shifts and change, I'm ready to shift and change with it without um, fist clenched, holding tightly to things. I can hold it like a you know cupped hand so yeah. that I'm holding it with care, but also loosely enough that if it needs to fall away, it can. I'd be curious for me, the, the huge shift uh, was obviously Jesus is perfect theology, but from there, Jesus revealed God as a father. And then of course you come into the triune understanding of, uh, of the Holy spirit, the feminine side. But, but what, what I'm, it was a relational, uh, aspect, of course, love, everything in, in the context of love is relational. The Liberty you're talking about, I I'm fast forwarding because of just the nature of what you were sharing, uh, to something I pulled from your book on love and freedom. Uh, where you say, don't ever become so enlightened that you lose sight of people. One of the things that remains attractive about the wisdom teacher Jesus is the way he included, you can't teach me anything if it's not rooted in love. And then you go on to not nationalism, not certainty, not theological interpretation, not German philosophy, this is awesome, not spiral dynamics, which I think is really cool, not even critical race theory. Uh, how are you living Christ? How is infinite reality, the ground of all being, expressing itself through you? How are you participating with love? Uh, I love this. You say you can be as smart as Einstein, as holy as the Pope, as woke as Angela Davis. But if it does not bear the mark of love, it's all dung. All oh, dung. Yeah. <laughs> and I that's for where, and I, I'm not even, I, I'm not even concerned about people being angry or people being loud yeah. Yeah. Or people being soft or people yeah. being silent. Yeah. What I'm concerned about is, can I hear love through? Yes. Your, or can I hear love through your sound? Can Where is the mark of love? And I'm always, always turning my ear and my heart toward the love bearers. Who is carrying love? Yeah. And, and that's, 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 you know, I want to gather the love bearers. And we're in a time where we need... Those who yeah. bear the mark and carry love, you know, um, with intentionality and awareness that they they know that they have been touched and they know the old folks used to say, I know I've been changed, you know, <laughs> um, that love has, you know, called my name. Like I I know, I know. And and that's that's I want to hear that voice because it those people are praying. You know, they, they are seeing what love sees and they are speaking it in agreement. Their lives are a prayer. Um, you know, their words carry the energy of love and love transformed. Love is life giving. So yeah. if that's what's coming forth, it, it is producing life. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, that's huge for me. That's huge. The um, this other centered, of course, love is defined uh, as there's no greater love than that one would lay his life down for his friend. This is what mm -hmm. Jesus says. And then he does that. He calls all of us friends. Yes. And so this is the love that can be trusted. Yeah. It is, it is, it looks like Jesus, it's God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. Yes. There's a, uh, for me, um, I, I read, uh, Paul Young's, uh, endorsement of your book and beautiful and then at the end he says if you don't want to be challenged or something to that extent like don't read this book and i chuckled because i i realized um i had to go back through and start reading again realizing oh yeah there's some things that might uh be challenging but there's so much uh liberty and grace in the in what we're and what you're going after that I, I i guess for me the great liberty of living from and living in the context of union. And I think maybe we can talk about growing up in separation, awakening to this inclusive love uh, that is the gospel, this Trinitarian grace-based union-based perspective that Jesus revealed that then exposes dualism. And, and um, you go after that a lot in this book, but I realize um, Paul's not wrong that there's some uncomfortable uh, things that you're addressing, uh, but it's safe because you're not here to make a point or to win an argument or to debate, but to reveal and to invite 
people into uh, this encounter with a love that can be trusted, even when your ideology or theology is being challenged. Um, maybe, maybe for me, for me, the big shift 15 years ago, uh, really in, in the language that I've tried to put around it in the last 15 years is that I, I was living in the context of separation for something, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I was living at like the rich young ruler trying to follow the law to its conclusion, which is the ultimate conclusion. He, he says, I've been doing it all, but more am I lacking? That's what he said. So he's done everything and he comes to the conclusion that everything isn't enough. I'm still lacking. So it's that context of trying to get to something, living in the, in this dualistic world of either or trying to prove, trying to earn. And 15 years ago, I had a profound, uh, it was a two year journey that took, took me to a profound revelation of, of Jesus got the well pleased before he did any of the stuff. He lived in the context of union. And suddenly I was living from the place of everything he has is mine. There is no separation in the nature of love. And I had to begin to address dualism and dualistic thinking, hierarchical thinking, uh, in all of my structures and all of my understandings and, and some of the things we talked about. Speak to us about dualism. In fact, I'm going to read a quote. Is that all right? Can I do that? I'm talking yeah. too much. You tell me. No, you go right ahead and read the quote. Okay. It's your quote. I'm going to quote you. <laughs> your publisher sent the book and sent over some questions. I was like, oh, that's helpful. I've never had that before. <laughs> okay. The title of this book, I don't even know if we've said it yet. It's, uh, and the restorative power of love in an either or world. We'll make sure that that's uh, in there. Uh, the restorative power of love and either or explain what you mean by either or what is dualism and why doesn't it help to resolve tension? And this is your quote I'm pulling. Dualism does not resolve tension. It only furthers our divide. Um, speak to that a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you were talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because often when we think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what we tend to get stuck on is evil. Like this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. But it's the tree of both good and evil. And it's our knowledge of it. And what happens is in, in my head, I'm envisioning a scene that goes down the middle that creates a split. Yeah. Um, right. And so what we do is, in dualism, in dualities and binaries, we categorize things. We separate them. When you talk yep. about um, that, we separate it. And often we separate it based on comfort level. You know, sure, what makes sure. us comfortable? What makes yeah. us uncomfortable? Yeah. What do we feel safe with? What makes us feel unsafe? What do we feel certain about? What do we not feel certain about? Um, what do we agree with? Agreement. Yep. You know, what do we not agree with? And so, and we, we neatly, when life is not neatly, but we neatly try to categorize and separate things and parse them out. Yeah. And if you think about it, that seam or that split, as we divide things into these binaries, we create a wider and a wider and a wider ca chasm. We just yeah. create a divide, like this yeah. big pit. And for me, one one day when I was just sitting face to face to face, um, I saw this word and like just like rise to the fore. Yeah. But it but it's shaped like a bridge over this chasm, right? And I had this idea of and being the bridge to our return. That it it was the how you mend like um we don't want to erase the chasm as if it has never existed, right? Because yeah. that would not be true to yeah. who we are and to our history. But right. if you have this bridge that links us back together, that turns us toward one and one another once again, how, what is the thing that's going to do that? And it has to be something that's big enough to hold the contradictions, to hold the paradox. Yeah. And inside of love, the biggest thing that can do that is and. Yeah. Um, you know, and... And, and it, it holds, there's a place, there's a place for you to think the way you do and believe what you do without someone trying to change that. And for someone else to believe differently without in freedom, to have the freedom to do that, as long as it's not 
causing harm to the personhood of right. someone, you know, um, right. but to, to do that until as, as we're trusting love, because love brings us all to wholeness. Love brings us all to truth as we turn our hearts towards love and enter that journey. Um, I think fear causes us to rush that. But and is this place that allows us to to kind of hold that. I, I've been reading a book by a, a, an author named Cindy Lee, and it's called um, Unforming, Decolonizing Western Spiritual Formation. Yeah. But in the book, she talks about how in Taoism, which is a, a different faith tradition than our Christian faith, but Taoists teach about contradictions. Yeah. And contradictions are always held together. They're not separated, right? Yeah. And so if we are formed in contradictions instead of dualism, we learn to hold them together instead of separating them and fragment, yeah. fragmenting them and cutting them off. And so when I turn inside of love and I'm sitting in that hidden place, what brings me together, right? You know, Jesus is like, gather the fragments, let no fragments remain, gather it yeah. all, right? Yeah. And so if I'm gathering it all, and as Father Richard Rohr says, everything belongs. That's a hard yeah. pill to swallow. <laughs> but if I'm if I'm putting this all together, how how do I hold this? Yeah. What helps me to be large enough in myself to trust love enough That's that it. this can be, and this can be, and That's this it. can be, and this can be, and this can be. Yeah. But in my Humans are like meaning making people like we have to make meaning of everything. We need an explanation for everything yeah. because of our the way we have been discipled um, into ration and logic and reason. We've got to understand it. I think love invites us to understand some things, yes, and to have a place for mystery, to have yeah. a place for mystery to exist where there is no explanation. Sometimes that mystery unfolds and it does, you know, reveal itself, but sometimes mystery is just hovering in there, you know? Yeah. When, when it comes to conversations and where walls tend to go up, um, often I was asked a question, uh, in a small group earlier this week and you kind of reminded me of it. Um, and it was, they were asking me about, um, entrapment, religious entrapment. And, and the answer I gave was you, when, when you've been asked a question that wants to count sins, that's a religious entrapment question. That's how, you know, uh, because now that you've been placed in the, in the bondage of moralism where you have to do the dualism of good or evil. And yes. then I used, I, I used the, the story of Jesus. Cause I, I think two, I use two stories, one where the fella is b born blind and the disciples want to know the cause and effect. They're thinking very dualistic. They're thinking in the context of separation. And so all they can do in that world is count sins. Cause this is the, when people are hearing you, they're going, wait, wait, because all of the questions, all of the, what about sin is the first thing. What about uh, the other side? What about uh, if we, if we don't, if we make room for that, you know, how do we win in the end? They're thinking in this dom domination type of mindset, which is that, 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 uh, the law tree of the nose of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, uh, the disciples say who, who sinned that, he, that he was born blind. Was it him or his parents? That was a cultural understanding. Jesus says wrong question. And, uh, and then begins to introduce a, 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 the knowledge or the tree of life, if you will, or l a love that can be trusted. This is, hey, hey let me show you who I am and yes. the paradigm I live in. And he heals the guy. And of course, the second story I used was the woman caught in adultery, where again, they try to entrap him with a moralistic good and evil question, trying to entrap him there. And it's the question, right? It's the, it's the pushback you get. And the invitation you're inviting him to is Jesus reveals the trap by setting it back on them. Yeah. Uh, they they end up realizing uh, they, they, that this isn't going to work. They have to step away. And what I love about it is then he he does what 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 you can trust. He says, "Where are your accusers?" Oh, so we're not living in a, a world of accusation. Right. He says, "Where are your accusers? They're gone." He actually asks her to look around. And then what I love is he says, "Neither will I accuse you." And I've heard people preach. I've heard people preach that oh he could have accused him. I'm like, no, he couldn't have. 
He was saying, I don't participate in accusation. I, One of my God favorite things about that story. Yeah, go for Jesus it. Jesus is writing in sand. Yes, that's right. You know, right? Like, and for me, I I always think about, um, you know, anything you write in sand, it's not permanent. It's going to, oh, wow. footsteps are going to wipe it away. You can wipe it away. Water can Come wash on. it away, right? It's not going to be there. And when I think about my own spiritual journey and I think about my Christian beliefs and how things have changed. I love that he wrote in sand because yeah. it's not set in stone. It can Come be on. changed, right? And so so I like that. When I think when I think about, you know, him tending with care toward her, but even if he was, you know, counting and measuring, and I, I have several, there are several pieces in, in the book about counting and, and measuring because yeah. I think we get trapped in the competition and the comparison. And you're right, Jason, that's how we get to power over instead of power with. And that's how we get to domination and hierarchy is in where do I rank? Where do I, how do I fit in? Okay. If this is the totem pole, how do I move up on the totem pole and, and that kind of thing. But I, the thing that I love most about that story is that he's standing there with her and they, they are counting all the sins, but there he is just, Writing in sand. Felicia, that's Writing. amazing. It, it, what what came to my mind when you said it is once upon a time, uh, uh, God had had to write it in stone because the people, uh, they demanded it. And so he said, okay, I'll do this, but this isn't the whole game. The whole, so my goodness, that's <laughs> profound because now you're saying, no, 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 this is in sand. Cause, because I, I, I say love is a circle in this. Uh, I, I love to say that the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Wasn't an invitation. And if you think hierarchical, you'll get dizzy. But if you think in the context of a circle, you'll realize that sometimes love goes first, sometimes love goes last. That's right. And what, whatever love, whatever's required of love in that moment. And, yeah. and suddenly we're not playing domination yeah. or hierarchy. I'm not playing domination at all. And that's how I want to live my life. I want to live my life. I, I remember this time um, we had some very close uh, friends now. They actually were our youth pastors when Doug and I were pastoring. And um, when we moved from Virginia to Georgia, they actually moved with us. And um, the the wife, she had had um, an illness that landed her in the hospital for a little bit. And everything in me wanted to just rush in and save and swoop in and do all the things and all of that. And before my inclination to cross the boundary of where I end and another person begins. Right. I pause in that moment and I said, love, what should I do? Come on. And I heard so wow. clearly, sometimes love pursues and sometimes love pulls back. Wow. And this is a time to just pull back and wait. And when, when it's clear, when it's clear, you'll know. Right. Yeah. And it, there's so much wisdom inside of that. So it's just like what you said, sometimes love is first and sometimes love is last. And the thing that the, the beauty of this is, is the invitation into a relationship. Yes. yes. In that dance, you can't go by a formula. Like how you know how to show up is because I am present to this present moment and I'm participating with love and whatever is before me, whatever is before me. So it's this constant, alive dance, you know? Yeah. Here will I say, oh, oh, oh. Hey guys, interrupt him for a second. Glad you're here. So thankful for this podcast. Thankful to get to do this with friends. Thankful for Derek and all of those who have navigated it with us. Listen, this podcast is done under our nonprofit. A family story. 12 years ago, I had a vision and I wrote it down. I'm going to read it to you. Family story is a relational community of creatives, family and friends. I see all of us as creatives. We do life together. We envision and express God's love through our gifting and grace. We are worshipers, dreamers, storytellers, and preachers, a family of dads and moms, brothers and sisters, daughters and sons, united by a passion to know and reveal God's perfect love feel like I'm seeing the fulfillment of some of that vision 12 years ago. The mandate on A Family Story was to create media content catalytic for an encounter with the love of God. 
familystory.org is our website. I encourage you to go there. There's a whole lot of media content there. There's books and articles. Uh, there's films, some music, and uh, this podcast. That's the home of Rethinking God with Tacos, which is pretty dang cool. It's been life-giving, as I said, the community around it, the community of creatives, of family and friends that's growing. Uh, it's blown me away. And so I'm thankful. I'm thankful uh, for all the relationships, connections, and I'm thankful for all those who've given. Rethinking God with Tacos is listener-supported. If you'd like to support us, you can go to familystory.org. Uh, again, we're a nonprofit. And I would encourage you to join us on our Facebook group, uh, follow us on Instagram, all the socials. Uh, if you're curious how to find me on the socials, it's at Jason Clark is. Otherwise, like, share, uh, write a review on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, tell your mom. We really are loving doing this, and I'm so thankful for everyone here. All right, it's time to get back to the podcast. It's um, I'm, you got me all, I'm all excited. I, I love this conversation. Um, I think we've laid a pretty good foundation for you to talk about your childhood and to share a little bit about, um, you grew up in the South and yeah. you were, as a black girl. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a Canadian kid who, what I knew about, about, um, what was happening in the South was on television and movies. There's, there's certain uh, things that you could address in Canada. We, we have our own sins. Yeah. But uh, then I moved to Jackson, Mississippi when I was uh, in my uh, mid-20s and have been really uh, trying to learn and repent ever since. Um, rethink. So share a little bit, could you, on yeah. this? I, I grew up in the South. I was born in the 70s, and um, my family, both sides, mom and dad, is from a um, small rural Johnston County town. And even though it was the 70s, um, I, I think what I want to say about the South is a lot of the South changed because it had to, not because it wanted to. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so meaning that because of the work of Dr. King and the civil rights movement and even the Montgomery boycott movement, economically, people, businesses had to change and they had to embrace these new laws, yeah. but the artists didn't want to. Yeah. And yeah. so in a lot of ways, I, I believe that behavior modification has failed us. And I believe that a lot of what we are seeing today is the results of that failure Yeah. yeah. Uh, because hearts weren't transformed. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so behind closed doors, <laughs> that hate and the resentment of having to do what one didn't want to do was still brewing and festering. Right. And yeah. so I've heard it said many times from both white people and black people that the South worked because people knew its place. And as a what I can say is that I no one ever set me down as a child and said, OK, you know, when you pass a white person on the sidewalk, step to the side or keep your head down or don't say so and so. Um, there weren't like verbal instructions like that, but you could feel um, you could feel it in the body movement. You could feel it in the way my relatives drew drew up, closed themselves off in the presence of there was a freedom and a largeness um, to take up space on the yeah. black side of town. But right. once you cross the tracks into the white side of town, um, you know, it. there was a different way that you moved in your own being. Yeah. Um, I tell the story of going to Jones's, which is a cafe in um, Clayton, my hometown. And for the longest time, really, honestly, probably I graduated high school in 90. So, yeah. um, but for the longest time, you know, black people went to the back door to get their um, food. You would call in on the phone, place your order, go pick it up. Not that you couldn't, of course, go into the restaurant because the laws had changed. Supposedly yeah. you could. But if you open that first door at Jones's for a long time, it, it has changed. I will say that. And it, it did change. But for a long time, if a black person opened that front door, it went like record scratch in that place. Right. And, you know, and so you, you went it. in feeling like, oh, you know, <laughs> This is a brave move to walk in here, you know? Wow. Um, 
but you know, and so again, the things have changed now. It's not that, but growing up, that still was very much a part of my, the way that we moved and situated ourselves in that small town. Um, you were home, you know, before dark, you, you weren't out in cars late at night. There still was a lot of safety issues um, and things. And so, so even, even the mixing of friends, you might play with someone at school, but, but that was it. Like that's, you you told that story in the book. Something that happens here and our parents and our grandparents don't know this is going on on both sides. Because that was just a huge, you didn't do that. It was a huge no-no kind of thing. Um, And so what ended up happening in in my own life, um, when Doug and I got married, we, we both, when we got married and we started in ministry, we made the decision that we wanted our kids to be raised in a church space that in our minds mimicked the kingdom of God, meaning that we wanted it to be multi-ethnic. Yeah. So as adults, we intentionally left black church settings and went to more multi-ethnic type churches, which even at that time, multi-ethnic meant you, they were predominantly white. You just right. had, you know, a mixture. Fortunately right. in Virginia, because it's a military town, sure. it really was multi-ethnic and that yeah. wasn't just black and white there were yeah. you know filipinos as well there were asian there's african there's um people that came from england you had you know all british so there's a, just a, a a wealth of yeah people, yeah um that our kids got to grow up around and then they went to a school that had a large large uh, population of jewish students as well okay um so we were able to give that to our kids in a way that was our heart's desire to do. Um, But when you're not amongst your people, that also opens you up to some microaggressions and macroaggressions that you have to deal with. And, and, you know, and our kids have made different decisions for their lives based on their own childhood, you know, growing up as well. But that was kind of from childhood into adulthood and the decisions that, that kind of led, led me there. Yeah. Um, my, my parents adopted, so I have two Brown brothers and, and we've often talked about cause their upbringing was in Jackson. Yeah. And of course everyone, they were loved and there was community around them, but we've yeah. talked often, uh, or occasionally we've talked about, uh, how subtly, um, they knew they were different. There was, there was not just because they were part of a, a white family, but because of where they were. I, and yeah. I often, we often wonder if it had been, how it would have been different and the things they had to navigate and all of the, it's unspoken, but it's there. It's um, there. Yeah. And you, you talk about it, uh, even with your kids here, I'm going to read something because you, you wrote about how you went to visit your grandma in the summers growing up and, and she was in DC. And so she was able to take you to museums and kind of take you and introduce you to the yeah. I traveled through museums and that exposure that my grandmother gave me. Yeah. I think that probably, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it all works out. It all works together to who you are today, obviously, and the ability to live in dissonance and, and, and to investigate things because you've, you wrote this when we remain stuck in the loop of our, of our story without consideration of others' stories, particularly when, Ours is framed in or lived in response to a Eurocentric patriarchal dominant paradigm as the standard of measurement for all other stories. Uh, We are left with an incomplete model. Um, Exposure to other stories is an invitation. Like I said, I've taken a lot of quotes from your book. Exposure to other stories is an invitation, a gateway to knowing, but it's merely that an op it's merely that an opportunity to know. A welcoming and acceptance of diversity may create familiarity, but it's not the same as knowing. Deep, intimate knowing empowers agency, offers reciprocity, and through mutuality affords us the opportunity to be custodians of our own story without being othered as an aside or a concession uh, to dissent. This is what your uh, um, 
addressing essentially, right? I mean, yes. I, I stopped quoting you. I could have kept going, but yeah. maybe speak a little bit <laughs> to that uh, yeah. because I feel like that's setting up what, what you were really what you were saying, and and the the ability to have that perspective um, is huge, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I I I don't. Doug and I used to say quite often when the kids would get kind of narrow and we would hear them say something we'd be like, Ooh, we need to send them on a mission trip. <laughs> and it, it wasn't true. even so much. Some of it is the service piece, sure. but also the, it's the exposure to a world outside their own. That's it. Yep. And for me, what I know is that, um, one, my grandmother also worked at George Washington hospital and that she was in the operating room the day they brought Reagan in, oh, which is like our huge, family's thing, but, um, I met Reagan, but she worked with so many different people from around the world. And yeah. so when they got together, you were exposed to their food and their language and their culture yeah. and their dance yeah. and their music. Right. And it's not just yours. And it, that world seemed very normal that everyone had a culture, um, and everyone shared it freely. It wasn't, yeah. it didn't feel threatening in that way. Yeah. When when um, Doug was a naval officer, our lives included, you know, lots of different times where we were exposed to other other races and other ethnic groups and other cultural traditions and norms and again food and things and that all of the exposure broadened. It helped me sit. One of the beautiful things about my life, Doug and I have again, live several places, but we drive a lot across America yeah. and I'm a city person. Like I love, the, I love the cityscape. I draw energy from the cities. I okay. love the urban space. But when I drive from Albuquerque, New Mexico, through Oklahoma, Kansas, Iowa, and I'm seeing these places, I understand how a rural person living in Oklahoma or Iowa, you know, or a person that lives in Maine or a small town in Vermont or a small town here yeah. in Minnesota yeah. would think a lot differently than a person and their needs are different and their desires yeah. are different and their right. concerns and their wants and their cares and their fears are different than a person who lives in an urban space in a very dense populated Atlanta or Baltimore or yeah. even Minneapolis here, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that is different. And so I'm I'm trying to ask you to understand something that you cannot even envision because you've never experienced it. But when I read someone else's story, listen to someone else's story, read a book, taste some food, it broadens my capacity that even though I cannot empathize in like putting myself in your shoes, I can at least open myself up a little bit to allow space for your story and your experience to sit alongside mine. Yeah. And that's, and that's the beauty. That's I, and. I yeah. keep saying that I includes, and for me, the, the part of, part of, and is, and it changes me first. It changes the eye, but yeah. I is not separate or individual alone. I yeah. includes, and what Anne does is it broadens, it broadens, it opens up space for me to include you and your story and yeah. a transracial adoption story, yeah. you know, in this, it, yeah. there's a place for this. And yeah. inside of that, there's a place for me to have compassion for the complexities and the nuances because it's, it's not, living is not neat and orderly and tidy. It's just not, <laughs> right? And so really? we have to allow space for the messiness of our humanity yeah. Yeah. Um, without without incriminating each other, without the suspicion, without the mistrust. And and Graham's for me, and I, I, I think what she wanted, knowing that um, moving to D.C. was like, you know, going from this small town of Clayton, North Carolina to Washington, D.C., you know, that's kind of like the Jeffersons. You're moving on up. She's moving to a big city compared to where we were. And, you know, and and I think what she wanted for us is to know that there was something bigger than just this. Home was always rooted in my grandmother. She, when her mother got sick, she actually retired early and moved back to Clayton to take care of her own mother. Okay. Um, 
So home was always there. She always came back. There was yeah. always a return to, but she knew that there was something bigger. And I think without, again, without sitting down and having this lecture, her actions told us, invited us to know for ourselves that there was something bigger so yeah. that we could see the world and know of a world bigger than just, you know, this. Um, and it did so much for me. I'm, I'm deeply, deeply, deeply grateful to her for that. Yeah. That's beautiful. I, you, yeah. um, you t tiptoed or you, you touched on the subject. It's a big subject in the book. Uh, I'll quote, uh, empathy fosters deep knowing, uh, is what you, uh, one of the lines you wrote, uh, that I just, I circled, uh, you go into really what I, I think of what you were just talking about. Um, I think, and is deeply connected to, to empathy and compassion, but I would say empathy is, is where you really help us rediscover and rethink, uh, the importance of that. Again, that connecting to each other, um, you could speak a little bit about that. I've got a, I've got some other questions, but I, I think that that's what you're getting after. I really love. We had yeah. a conversation about it last time. Um, uh, my heart continues to expand around, uh, you know, Brene Brown's uh, phrase, which my wife always tells me, "Baby, I said that first. You just heard it from her later." And I'm like, "Oh, I she's I was, she's like, I was doing that for years." And then Brene Brown came along, and you're giving her all the credit. But people, everyone's doing the best they can. You know that 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 phrase, "Everyone's doing the best they can," is is dripping in empathy and uh, um, it, it is creates deeper. connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do believe that empathy is is really like um, the gateway to deep knowing. I think often, particularly because, um, <laughs> and I. I laugh because I say, well, most of my friends are white and they really, they really are. And I have a black friend. She's like, Felicia, why do you always say that? And I'm like, because I have two, I have two black friends like you and my other girlfriend. Y'all are my only two black friends and all my other friends are white. And she's like, do you, you just should hear how that sounds. And I think about, we laugh about it, but I think about when people work together, when they go to church with someone yeah. who's not the same race and they're like, oh, my black friend or oh, my this friend. Right. And in their mind, they see um, the contextual knowing as a friendship. Yeah. And, but I think one of the things that empathy allows is a deeper knowing beyond context. Yeah. Right. And, and so... I, I want to know, I'm after the heart. I'm after the heart of the matter. What, yeah. what matters to you? What I asked some questions in the book about um, the most marginalized person in your community. What does it feel like for that person right now? What are they afraid of? Doug and I talk often about this, about the price of groceries right now. Yeah. And yeah, That's good. Uh, and I told Doug the other day, I came and I said, there's too many families in our world that are eating rice and beans right now to survive. They have to be because our grocery prices are off the charts. Yeah, yeah. And so empathy leads me to care about what is mattering to others. That's good. What, what matters for you? What, what of your safety is threatened? What of your livelihood is threatened? What, what concerns keep you up at night? What's lying awake there? And, and that's the thing that I feel like Empathy invites us into a deeper knowing and a deeper caring. And it doesn't mean we have to become saviors and go out and try to fix it all, right? Yeah, yeah. But the fact that I can even pause and say, I'm concerned. Yeah. And I see you and I hear you and I, I want to know. I just, it, even if I can just be in silence with you around yeah. this and yeah. hold the same grief and concern that you have about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. For now that you, might be enough, but that's how I, I feel about empathy. I, again, you may never have my lived experience. I will never have your lived experience. Right. right? But if I can hear your story and hold it with a deep reverence, with sacredness and humility, then that gives me some empathy for why you believe the way you do or think the way you do or vote the way you do or yeah. whatever like yeah. that. So I, yeah. I do feel like empathy is a huge part of then we're, we move, you know, to connect with one another. Yeah. Then, Cause then we're seeking connection. That's, that's mm -hmm. the high watermark. You, uh, you actually, I'll, since you said it and here's another, uh, am I, these are some questions you had us asking each other that I loved and 
<laughs> there's so much more, but am I, a, am I more aware of the oppressed and the marginalized than I was six months ago? Uh, I love that question. Am I more loving? This is the next one. Am I more loving than I was six months ago? Am I more forgiving than I was six months ago? And then you make this statement that is beautiful and could be broken down. But if hell is a state of mind created by the illusion of love's absence, and we're back to separation, then heaven is the peaceful contentment of living, moving, and having my being in love. What I love about this is you know, we're not we're asking questions um, that are checking our heart in the uh, in the place where I'm not stepping outside of a love that has the answers, that that love is ultimately the answer. Um, it's the answer to racism. It's the yes. answer. It's the answer to every question. Yes, and so I don't that. have to. I don't have to step in empathetic and then get and then get terrorized and walk in fear. Yeah. If I stay connected here, then I can empathize with you, and then I can actually operate. This is where I'm fascinated. I, I see the story of, uh, and I could tell you what I see the story of. Um, Jesus coming back to heal Lazarus and, and he operates, was it, um, um, um oh, I can't remember it was, I always get it wrong. Was it Mary who came out, uh, or Martha that met him? I think oh, it might've been, remember. yeah, I think it might've been Martha who mm -hmm. was one of the, one of the, the sisters. And, and, and she said, if you'd come earlier and then there's this most profound statement, Jesus wept. And if you know the whole story, you already know that Jesus knew the end of the story because he said it days earlier that Lazarus will not die. So in this moment, he's weeping. He's operating in this felt. He's stepped inside the moment, the, 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 the moment that, this, that the sisters are having and the moment that everyone else is having, the reality of death in this world. And then, and I say that's the, the most empathetic, you know, Jesus is the most empathetic uh, picture of, of, of humanity and God. And the, the incarnation is the, uh, the revelation of empathy. Mm -hmm. But then he also operates in compassion because he's one with this measureless source of love. And he, and he, and he actually has a solution to the problem. Yeah. I think uh, to me, I, I don't know if I'm on, if I'm, if I'm preaching it right, but I would love, I would love you. I just, I love that love is the place where we can find our confidence. Yeah. Uh, and from yeah. that place, we have a stable ground to be able to yeah. uh, participate in in, no, in both. I think you're so right, right Jay. And I, you know, is in that story that you're telling there, and when he's talking about Jesus, what all I can think is, um, you know, he felt it. He felt yeah. it. He, yeah. Like it, that all of his, it penetrated beyond um, the barriers of our armor, right? And if yeah. we, if we could allow it to penetrate beyond our own barriers to feel it. And for the first time, apparently the commercial has been out for a while, but I just saw it this week for the first time. There's a Subaru commercial and being death, you know, it just, the commercial hit me in a totally different way, but there's a, um, it's the commercial of a, a black father and a young black son who happens to be deaf and they're in the back seat. And the father takes a detour and the son is, is signing and he's basically asking his dad, where are you going, dad? And he has this, you know, the kid uh -huh. look, the kid look whether death or not. And um, and he he takes him to a waterfall and they go to a waterfall and, you know, um, the water is rushing and uh -huh. the son turns to his dad and he signs, dad, do you feel that? <laughs> and when his dad looks at his son, you can feel nothing but love. You can, you, you can feel it. You can feel the love. And the dad signs back, I feel it. Come I, on. And I, <laughs> I think so often of that, like, um, can we open ourselves up enough, you know, to feel it, to feel it? Because when we do feel it, Jason, that, that empathy moves into compassionate act, action you know yeah. empathy allows us to bear witness yeah to feel the vibration of it to, to yeah. feel it whether that's the joy or the tragedy or the grief or the lament or even the anger it allows yeah. us to bear witness right yeah. and then compassion moves us to action it moves yeah. us to to something and that's that place where we don't rush in on our own to try to do it we just pause yeah and we go, you know love what does love look like here? <laughs> um jim finley asked this question he says all things considered what is the most loving thing i can do right now right um, like all things considered 
What is the most loving thing that I could do for myself right now? What is the most loving thing I could do for the world right now? What is the most loving thing I can do for this person in front of me right now? Yeah. All things considered. And when I ask that question of love, love, love comes first or love comes last, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. love comes, love yeah. either it, it pursues or it pulls back yeah. or it just sits with it and bears with yep. us. But love, love will guide us and lead yeah. us if we trust yeah. love. That's right. If we trust love. And um, Paul Young and I talk often about, um, I was laughing when you was reading Paul's endorsement, by the way, because when Paul was, when, when Paul read this book, um, I asked him, you know, for an endorsement and I wasn't sure. I asked quite a few people, yeah. and, but when he read it, he was emailing me as he was reading it. And so whatever was rising in him, he would be like, oh, you know, and say something. Oh, wow. And it was so funny. But Paul always says, um, and I remember this, I actually think it's in his book, The Shack, but love for Paul and love for me is Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Mm. Um, and I wrote this in the book, you know, do do I trust love with you the way yeah. I trust love with me? Yeah. Yeah. Father, into your hands, I commit Jason's spirit. Yeah. I commit my spirit. I commit yeah. the world's spirit. Yeah. You know, do I trust or am I going to be so scared that I'm trying to manipulate and rearrange and rush yeah. in to fix? Yeah. And I think that's the invitation before us. It's, it's not to bury our heads in the sands. It is to be active participants with love yeah. and also to trust that love love wins. That's it. That's okay. it. Uh, the That trust thing is, uh, for me, is the key of it to everything. It's. Yeah. Uh, I had a friend years ago help me i was it was a couple books back and he said you know jason the only thing you care about is intimacy um and intimacy is connected to trust uh you can't you can't experience intimacy where there isn't trust and, right. and then of course where he isn't always good you can't trust him and so he he helped me realize the end result was yeah it's it's this into me you see yes. uh, here and with each other that that um it's what this is all about um uh, I, yeah. uh, I, uh, we've been going for a bit. I, I'm going to just breeze through cause there's so much you have contemplative, you have con contemplative practices to consider in this book. Uh, you get, on, you, uh, there's a section on secrets that I thought would help folks, um, uh, just, um, uh, just whether they're good or bad, just coming into a holistic relationship with God and each other. Um, you have guided inquiries uh, later in the book. I wrote, uh, I've got them all here. You talk about Bob Mumford and his seven trees, which was fun because uh, Bob was uh, one of my heroes and still a hero. Uh, I love uh, that. It was fun to see his name in there. And and uh, anyway, so much that that uh, I, I absolutely can't endorse this enough. I think there's so much life. Again, this is a masterpiece. I, I think we could do this for a while. But I, I want to respect your time, and we haven't talked tacos. Ah, uh, let's talk tacos. <laughs> you know, it's in the title. Of <laughs> <Felicia>. So, <laughs> uh, you're in Minnesota. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't know that I've had a taco in Minnesota. Is can you find one there, or are you going to have to go outside of the state to tell me this story? I, I can actually find some tacos in Minnesota. There's some, there's some good tacos. Actually, <laughs> there is um, one. Uh, there's an indigenous chef here whose name escapes me right now, but he has a rest in a restaurant called Awanami. So if you're ever in Minneapolis, it's O W N A M I. Um, if you're ever in Minneapolis, it's a must. And his okay. tacos are all, it's like elk, bison, boar. Oh, come on. Um, and then vegetarian, they do, you know, um, yep. indigenous, I have the three sisters, which are your beans, squash, and corn. Um, so I'm just okay. saying, um, <laughs> you, can't, you can't go wrong sitting down there. If you're, if you're lucky to get a seat, but the tacos okay. are amazing. And then there is also a... Um, Argentinian chef here that has four taco restaurants in the area that is off the chain. I'm, I'm still 
how do you say it, Jason? Is it birria? The taco with the um, uh, uh, birria. That. I think. Okay. Birria? I do not. I. 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 I'm struggling with that. I like. That's real the one with food. the with the drippings, right? Yeah. And you true. dip yeah. it. I, yeah. I my head over to the side. And, you know, <laughs> I, I like a really good taco with just some meat and you know chicken de gallo in it. Like I'm, yeah. I'm curious about my taco. I want some really good <laughs> season. You know. Carne asada or some. You I know, hear you. I hear you. Carnitas. I, I love a really good taco. A little cilantro? Are you? Are yes or no? Yes. I will okay. take. I will take a little cilantro, not a lot, but yep. a little cilantro in it, and then yep. hit it up with some freshly cut onions and tomatoes and That's squeeze it. of lime. And That's it. We're right. That's it. That's the original right there. You're, you're. Uh, it's a holistic approach to tacos. It's really simple. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Yes. Um, the only way I deviate is if there's some some shrimp or some really good fried fish. I will take a really okay. good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll try anything at this point. I'm I'm in on all of it. But what's but, the uh, most adventurous taco you've tried? Oh my goodness. Um, well, that's a good question. I I when I was when I we did a a cruise, and they had some sort of bug some sort of fried um and they put it in a shell i don't know that that counts as a taco but it was adventurous <laughs> and i took a bite of that some sort of fried uh grasshopper or something or um so maybe that would count <laughs> that, that probably would count yes. i'll give you that um uh, felicia i love love talking to you um tell folks how we can find you find this book and um, anything else that you're doing, uh, or where yeah. you're going to be? I, um, you can find me at FeliciaMurrell.com on my website. And, and then I am on Instagram <laughs> sporadically, but I'm there at yeah. hello Felicia underscore Merle. And then I'm always musing my opinions on Facebook and I can be followed there. Um, the book is available anywhere books are sold. Amazon is with my publisher, Whitaker House, on their website, bookshop.org, if you want to support independent bookstores. Um, there will be an audiobook available coming out and Kindle are version. Are you reading it? I am reading it, yes. So I'm really excited about that. Good. Um, so that is in the works, and they're hoping it will be released very close to the book's release date on February 13th. So Okay. Um are you still doing uh, Instagram with, uh, uh, you were doing a food, you had a food Instagram that I'm I do following. Have a Instagram. I'm trying to be more intentional this year about updating it. So I have started with my, now that we're in Minnesota, updating it with my Minnesota restaurants that I'm finding and exploring. So yeah. Okay. And that is um, at Feed the Foodie, F-E-T-H-E Foodie. So yeah. <laughs> I'd suggest following that. I, I I I haven't seen anything recently, but maybe I'm not paying attention. So no, I literally just uh, last week I st I was like, okay, I fell into a rut and I I stopped. Um, but I was like, I'm in Minnesota now. I have some great places to explore. So good. I put my first two Minnesota places up there a few days awesome. ago. So, yeah. Well, good. Um, I love this. We gotta. Um, put number the third uh, visit on. I'll get you a jacket, um, and we got to do it before a year's up. Uh, I look forward to that. Thanks so much for having me on, Jason. This was a yeah. delight. Yeah, I love talking with you, and I, 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 I want to get to the second half or maybe the, uh, the, the last two thirds of the book. But uh, I really appreciate you. Thankful for who you are and this book and what you're carrying and what you're giving away. So, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, myself or our guests, you can go to afamilystory.org. You can also go to afamilystory.org if you'd like to give. This is a listener supported podcast and we are incredibly grateful for your generosity. Hey, we have a Facebook group and it's pretty cool. Rethinking God with Tacos. You can join us over there. Lots of incredible conversation and community taking place on that page. And you can also follow us on all the socials, Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube, and others. Hey, I'd love it also if you uh, went on iTunes and left a review or shared or tweeted or liked. 
the podcast. Uh, let your friends know that this is a good place to hear about the love of God. I pray grace and wonder over your day.